the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. So as we approach the word today, let's honor the Lord. I'm going to get down on my knees, and would you honor the Lord by standing to your feet, and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Father, today we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and Lord, we give you thanks and praise for what you've already done in this place, God, and we love you, Lord. We're just excited to hear the testimonies of what's been done and what's going on currently, Lord, and we look forward to what you're going to do in our future. God, we thank you, Lord, that today as you uh, come and teach us, Holy Spirit, as we open up your word, that you would open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown today. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, I pray that you would touch us, heal us, encourage us, strengthen us, guide us, guard us, direct us. Give us the vision and the wisdom that we need for each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves only, but also we would ask it on all the churches that are preaching the gospel and teaching the word of the Lord, hearing the word of the Lord today, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. We love them. We don't think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, maybe you're like me, and your Bible, as you pick it up, just wants to fall open to the book of Hebrews. And so I thought today we might want to let it do that. So we're going to go to the book of Hebrews once again in the third chapter and and allow our Bibles to just flip open there to Hebrews, the third chapter, and get back into the book of Hebrews today. And, and, And as you're doing that, let me kind of review for a moment. Let me rewind your thinking a little bit. We've been discussing in the book of Hebrews uh, about the condition of the heart of the people of Israel. We've been uh, looking at an example that's contained in Scripture for you and I. The example is that of the nation of Israel who's been brought out of Egypt, and now here they are brought up to the edge of the promised land, right there uh, on the borders of the land that was promised to them, about ready to enter in. They sent in spies, you remember, and and those spies, those 12 spies spied out the land. They tasted the fruit. They saw the fortified cities. They saw the vineyards they didn't plant, the houses that they didn't build that were promised to them. They tasted of the fruit and brought back a report that the land was good. The land was everything that God had promised. But you remember, 10 of those spies had an evil report. 10 of those spies brought back a report saying, but there's giants in the land. We were like grasshoppers in their sight and in our own sight also. And two of those spies brought back a good report and said, no, we can do this, we can take this. But because of the evil report and because of the evil heart of unbelief, as it says in the book of Hebrews, they were kept from entering into the promised land. They hardened their hearts, they rebelled against God, and now they were reaping what they had sown, the consequences of their actions, and they were turned away from entering into the promised land to wander in the desert. Now, you and I pick up the story in Hebrews chapter number 3, Taking a look at verse number 16, and it asks some questions in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16, and we'll read through verse number 19. It says, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? Verse number 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They were not operating in faith. Today I want to talk to you about entering in to faith. The title of today's message is Entering In to Faith. What kept these people out of the promised land was their unbelief. Here they were, they had been brought out of Egypt. And the Bible tells us that they walked through the Red Sea by faith, that they were, they were all taken out by faith, and that they had walked through that wilderness time, and they had gone through that time, and now here they were at the edge of the border of the promised land. Here they were about ready to enter in and take possession. And yet what stopped them is that they couldn't enter in because they were operating in unbelief. And so we've received the warning from Hebrews chapter number 3 that we are not to harden our hearts as they did in the rebellion. And now when we see the word, when we approach the word, we realize that there's promises that God has for us today. That these are not just stories kept in the word for thousands of years for us to learn a history lesson. No, this is something for you and I to take a look at and to see if we're going to do something, if we're going to go somewhere, if we're going to be anything with God, we're going to do what God has called us to do, be what God has called us to be. Now we have to approach 
the Word of God and, and see it not just as history, not just as stories, not just as poetry or wisdom or anything like that that's just sort of, you know, out there or sort of just a mental thing. No, this is the promises of God for my life personally. This is something that I've got to get a hold of. And so we approach the Word of God. Jesus told us to be careful how we hear. Told us that when we hear the word of God, we've got to receive it a certain way. He gave parables about the different kinds of soil. That's talking about our hearts and how we receive the word is very important. He told parables about a seed that was sown into the ground and the blade comes first and then it starts to develop the grain and then the, the full grain in the ear. What's going on? He's talking about how we receive the word of God. Why is that important? Because if we're going to enter in by faith, we've got to have faith. We've got to believe God. And the Bible tells us in Romans, the 10th chapter, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when we approach the word, when we hear the word, we've got to be very careful how we hear. We find in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16 through verse number 18, that there are some questions that are posed. That there are some questions that are asked. And these are questions that we should ask when approaching the word. Now think about it for a moment. There's questions in the Bible. And a lot of times when we read questions like this, you'll notice that the questions were answered. For who having heard rebelled was it not all those who were led out by Moses, right? Well, it answered the question. We kind of checked that off the list. Okay, that question's answered. Check, right? Then we go on to the next one, and and, and we we see that that question's answered too. Check. Okay, and then there's a third question. We see that that question's answered too. Check. But don't you think that if God included it in the Bible... That God would want us to pay attention and would want us to ask those questions and find out what's really going on more than just check it off a list. Otherwise, what's God doing? Why is God wasting our time? More importantly, why is God wasting his time? Oh, just because he lives in eternity and he can talk and, you know, kind of pontificate and talk a whole lot and use big words and fill up a page? Is that what God's trying to do? Do you think that God needs to fill up a page to impress us? Do you think that God is mixing words just to to take some more time? No, God never mixes words. God always knows exactly what he's saying. God always knows exactly what he's doing. And God is including these questions for you and I to take a look at, to ponder, to, to, to understand. Now, one more thing I've got to address. And that is that God never asks a question that he doesn't already know the answer to. God is not asking these questions for his benefit. Think about it for a moment. There's a lot of questions that we find that God asks in the Bible. Right at the very beginning in the book of Genesis, after Adam and Eve had eaten of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, they rebelled against God. Here comes God in the cool of the day. And he asks a question, where are you, Adam? Now, do you think God, the all-knowing God, the all-powerful God, the God who is everywhere all at once, do you think God was asking that question because he didn't know where Adam was? No, absolutely not. God knew exactly where Adam was. God had already seen what had taken place. God knew that they were going to rebel against him. That's why he already had the plan of redemption, the Lamb of God who was slain from before the foundation of the world. See, God already knew what was going to happen. God already knew where Adam was, so he wasn't asking the question for his benefit, but rather he was asking the question for Adam's benefit and for our benefit today. Where are you? Take a look at yourself. What's going on? Well, there's another question that follows that, right? God starts to talk to him. He says, have you eaten from the tree? He says, well, yeah, you know. And he says, why are you hiding? He says, well, because, you know, we heard your voice and we were afraid because we were naked. Now, all of a sudden, God asks another question. He says, who told you you were naked? Once again, we have to beg the question. Is God asking that because God didn't know who told Adam that he was naked? Absolutely not. No, God already knew that nobody told Adam he was naked. In fact, if you read the Genesis account, Satan didn't say, hey, Adam, by the way, now that you've eaten, i got to point something out to you. <laughs> Brother, you don't got no clothes on. You know, no, that, that's not what took place, right? Eve didn't whisper in Adam's ears. No, they took of the fruit, and their eyes were open, and they realized something, so that when God comes to him and says, who told you, Adam would think and say, well, no one told me. Something happened. Something took place. Okay, how about another 
man of God in the Bible that we see that God asks a question to. Elijah, right? Here's Elijah. He has this Mount Carmel victory. He puts a, he puts a, a thing out for the Lord, a sacrifice out for the Lord, and, and he says, whoever's God answers by fire, that's the true God that we shall serve, right? So we know that God answered Elijah's prayer by fire. Fire comes down out of heaven, devours the sacrifice, the wood, and the water that they had poured on all of it, looks it all up in the trough and everything. It's all gone, all obliterated, completely eaten up by the fire. Elijah says, get a hold of those prophets of Baal, right? And they slice them and dice them in pieces before the Lord there, and they have a great and a mighty victory. Now, all of a sudden, Jezebel, this wicked queen, we would know her as a hoe, right? (laughs) Come on, let's get real in this place. Can we talk? Okay, just making sure that we're mature in this place. If if that offends you, quit watching TV and stop renting videos, okay? (laughs) Praise God. So here's Jezebel, this this wicked hoe queen, and Jezebel starts breathing out threats against Elijah's life. Now, Elijah's just seen the Lord devour a sacrifice with fire from heaven. He's just cut down all of her prophets, right? Just won this great victory, and what does he do? He gathers up his robe, and he runs in terror, right? And he runs so far away that he actually passes out in a wilderness place, and he has to be strengthened by a supernatural angelic visitation because the journey's long. And so he ends up going to the mountain of the Lord, and he hides himself in a cave. Now, the word of the Lord comes to Elijah, and, and, and here's Elijah, and he's, he's moping, he's sobbing, he's feeling sorry for himself. And the word of the Lord comes to Elijah, and what does God say? God asks him a question. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, once again, is God asking the question for his own benefit? Or is God asking the question to show Elijah where he's at, to reveal what's going on in his heart? What's Elijah do? He starts sobbing, Lord, Lord, you know, uh, uh, they're they're, they're breathing out threats against me, God. They killed all your, I'm the only one that's left, God. God says, present yourself before the Lord, right? The fire breaks out, the wind breaks rocks, an earthquake, all that. Finally, this still small voice. So Elijah wraps his mantle around his face and goes out. And what happens? God asks the question a second time. In other words, you didn't get it, Elijah. Let me ask you again to identify where you're at. What are you doing here, Elijah? And we know the story, he responds the same way again. And God says, well, wait a second, I've got a remnant. I've got people that you don't even know about who haven't even bowed their knee to Baal. Now, here's what you're supposed to do. See, God wasn't asking the question for God's benefit. God was asking the question for Elijah's benefit and for our benefit today. See, these are not just stories. This is not just history lessons. This is not just information. No, this is something for you and I to get a hold of and to take it personally and to hear the word of the Lord. The Bible says they're examples for our life Today, So when we approach the word, there's some questions that we have to ask when approaching the word. We find these questions in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16 through verse number 18. Questions to ask when approaching the word. Number one is for who? For who? Who is this for? When we take a look at the word of God, we've got to ask ourselves this question. Who is this word for? Verse number 16 of Hebrews, the third chapter, says these words. It says, for who? Having heard, rebelled. Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And we have to ask that same question today. See, these people heard the word of the Lord. And now the question is, who having heard rebelled? Was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? When we approach the word, when we hear the word of God, when we're in prayer and the voice of the spirit comes to us, or when we hear a sermon preached and God is talking to us, or when we're reading the word and the word jumps out at us, Who having heard? For who? Who is this for? Is this just for the the pastor? Is this just for the holy people of God or those that are paid by the church? Oh, oh wait, is, is this just for the volunteers or that dude that's dressed really nice over there? You know, he looks a lot better than I do today. I, I came in my rags, and I, I guess I'm not as qualified because I don't look as good, or I, I, I'm not as educated, I'm not as smart, I'm not as good looking, or uh, I'm not dressed as nice. My social status can't be for me. Got to be for those other people. Uh, Is this just for the person sitting next to you today that's saying amen real good? Is this just for your husband who who thinks he knows it all or your wife who's super spiritual that brought you to church today? Who is this for? Is, Is this for just the other people or is this for me? 
personally? Is the word of God directed just at me? Is God speaking to me? Is God, the God of the universe, the God who breathes stars into existence and speaks and planets exist, is this God who names them all and, and who knows them all and who placed them all, who stretches out the galaxy, is that God speaking to me today? Yes, he is. God is intimately involved in your life. In fact, the Bible says that God knew you in your mother's womb. He took a cell from your mommy and a cell from your daddy. He put them together, and he started forming you. He started making you. He started writing your DNA. He started making an individual, and there has never been before, and there never will be another one of you. And God is interested in your life, and God is speaking to you today. <laughs> Who is this for? It's amazing in the, in the old King James Version, the way Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16 is written. If you got the old King James Version, you can read along. Or if you, if you got a different translation, that's all right. I'll put it up for you on the overhead. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 16 in the KJV says, For some, everybody say for some. <laughs> for some, when they had heard, did provoke. Albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Now, what is that talking about? Well, that's telling me that there were some... That rebelled, some that provoked God to wrath when they heard, but there were some that did not, right? They chose and said, well, that's, that's for me. That word of the Lord, that's for me. That's my word. That's my promise. There were 12 spies that went in, you remember. Ten of them did provoke, right? Ten of them did turn away from the word of the Lord. Ten of them operated in unbelief, but there were two that did not. Two of them said, no, that's my word. That's my promise. That's my land. That's my inheritance, and I'm going to get mine, right? Why did they say that? Because they believed the word of the Lord, and they went after the promise of God. If you would, just keep your finger in the book of Hebrews, or if your Bible does fall open to Hebrews chapter 3, you can just go with me to the book of Joshua. Sixth book in the Bible, book of Joshua. Last chapter of the book of Joshua, so if you hit Judges, just go a couple pages back. Joshua chapter number 24 and we get to hear the words of one of these spies that went in, who now is the leader of the nation of Israel. And they've gone in, they've had a great conquest, they've taken possession of the land, now they've divided up the land and given it to the children of Israel as their inheritance. And Joshua's about ready to end his assignment, and he's going on, and so he's preaching. He's given a sermon, and he's given his final words to the nation of Israel. And he's telling them, you need to serve the Lord. Tell them what to do. He said, serve the Lord. And we pick it up in Joshua chapter number 24 and verse number 15. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Joshua is speaking to the nation of Israel and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and I today. And he says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. Now, hold on a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. He just told them to serve the Lord. But then he goes on to say, and if it seems evil to you. To serve the Lord. Well, wait, serving the Lord, that's not evil. That's the right thing we're supposed to do. That's what we are supposed to do. But he just got done telling them, serve the Lord. And now he's saying, and if it seems evil to you, what does that mean? Does that mean, uh, he says, if it seems evil, that means, does it seem contrary to you? Contrary to your way? Contrary to your desire? Contrary to what you wanted to do? See, there, there is a way that seems right to a man. And so he says, serve the Lord, but if you don't want to serve the Lord, if you want to say, this is not for me, this is not my word, this is not my promise, this is not my God, this is not the way I want to live my life, I'm going to go after my own way. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Notice he said, no one else is going to make this decision for you. Even though this is the leader of the nation of Israel and he's just told him to serve the Lord, he says, choose for yourselves this day. Whom you'll serve. Ask yourself the question, is this for me? Or am I going to just let this be for someone else? Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Now look at the last sentence. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, Joshua made that statement. He said, listen, doesn't matter what anybody else does. This word is for me. You, you can do what you're going to do. Choose for yourselves. But as for me... And my house, we will serve the Lord. When he heard the word of the Lord, he said, who's this for? This is for me. Questions to ask when we approach the word. Number one is for who? For who? Second question that we find, turn back with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 3. Not only for who, but the second question we must ask is with whom? With whom? 
Hebrews chapter 3, verse 17 says this. It says, now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Oh, my goodness. So the question that we see that's asked is with whom? With whom was he angry 40 years? There were those with whom God was angry, and there were those with whom God was pleased. The question for you and I is whose company are we going to keep? Are we going to be a part of that company that fell in the wilderness that God was angry with? Or are we going to be a part of the company that God was pleased with and that entered in and took hold of the promise of God? Very important whose company you keep. Maybe you've heard the old statement. I'll start it. You can finish it. Birds of a feather, feather do what? They flock together, right? So we know that wh whatever kind of person you are, you will naturally gravitate towards those types of people. But the problem is, is that sometimes when we get in a certain company of people, we start to become like they are. You know, you will become what you hang around with. Let me say that again because you need to hear that. You will become what you hang around with. You know, if you're working on the job and there's a bunch of the, the brothers out there at the coffee pot and they start telling some dirty jokes, uh, it won't be long if you hang around that stuff for a while, you'll be the one telling the dirty jokes. You, you, you talk to the ladies on the phone and there's a lot of gossip going on and, and if you keep listening to that gossip, it won't be long before what you put in starts coming out. See, what you hang around you will become. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs that a companion of fools will come to ruin, but he who walks with the wise will himself be wise. See, you are what you hang around with. You will become what you hang around with just by association. So we have to ask the question, not only is this for me, we can say, yes, this word of God is for me. I, I, I believe it. I, I receive it into my life. But now, with whom? With whom am I going to keep company with? Am I going to keep company with the righteous or with those who are unrighteous? And I love what it says in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse number 33, in the New International Version. I'll put it up for you on the overheads. It says these words. It says, do not be misled. Oh, hold on. I don't, I don't think we all got that. It says, do not be misled. Did you see it? One more time. One more time. Do not be Misled. If you are being misled, then you're following the wrong crowd. Look what the verse goes on to say. Bad company corrupts good character. Listen, this is not some self-help wellness book. This, this is not Reader's Digest. This is not an internet suggestion. This is the B-I-B-L-E. This is the word of God for you and I today. This is what God is speaking to us. Do not be misled. Be very careful who you are following because bad company corrupts good character. But pastor, I'm going after them to get them saved. And so I got to relate. I got to be like them in order to have them accept me and come in. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. Your job is to preach the gospel and then leave the results up to God. That's your job. You need to keep company with the righteous. And that doesn't mean you forsake them and leave them in their sin on their way to hell. No, you still preach the gospel. You still go after them. You still be kind to them. But when it comes to who you keep company with, you keep company with the righteous. Keep company with people of faith, people that are going to encourage you in the things of God, not break you down and tear you down. Think about it. The majority of the nation of Israel rebelled. They operated in unbelief, and they didn't obtain the promise of God. But there were two spies that believed God. There were two guys that said, we can do this. And there were two families of those people that were able to go in with the next generation and receive the promise of God. One of them was Joshua, who we heard from. And now the second one, his name is Caleb. Now, if you don't know Caleb, you got you to gotta get to know Caleb. Caleb was a, was a really neat guy. Caleb encourages me. Caleb was, was a go-getter. In fact, Caleb's name means mad dog. That, that's my kind of guy. I mean, this guy goes after it. He saw something, he wanted it, and just like that mad dog, he went after it, he sunk his teeth into it, and he wasn't letting go. He said, no, that's my land, that's my mountain, that's what God had promised me, and that's where I'm going, that's what I'm going after. And so we got to decide whose company are we going to keep. Turn back with me to the book of Joshua. Keep your finger in Hebrews if you need to. Book of Joshua, go back there with me. Joshua chapter number 14. We heard from, heard from Joshua already, now let's hear from mad dog Caleb. See what he has to say to our lives today. Joshua chapter number 14. 
We're going to take a look in Joshua 14 at verse number 7 and verse number 8. Joshua chapter 14, verse number 7. Caleb says these words. He says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Notice he said this is how it was in my heart. When the word of God came, I realized it was for me. I got a hold of it, got it in my heart, and now when I spoke, that's what came out. This was my land. This was my promise. Now take a look at verse number 8. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So when Caleb asked the question, for who, he said, well, this is for me. And so I brought back word as it was in my heart. But then when Caleb asked the question, with who, he realized, man, my brethren, my brethren, this was the nation of Israel. This was his family. This was his kindred. These were the people of of God. This was the, the chosen people of God. And yet... When Caleb saw what was going on, what was going down, and realized what was taking place, he said, I'm not going to follow the crowd. I'm not going to follow my family. I'm not going to follow my friends. No, I'm going to wholly follow the Lord my God. Oh, I should have had a bigger amen than that. Think about it for a second. Think about it for a second. When the word of God comes to you, it's not always easy to follow it. Not always popular to do what God wants you to do. Because everybody else is jumping in, everybody else is having fun, everybody else is doing their thing, right? Everybody else seems to prosper and seems to be blessed and seems to be happy. And my goodness, they're out there at the clubs, they're out there at the raves, they're out there doing their thing, right? They're sniffing everything, snorting everything, drinking everything, and they're just having a good old time, don't have a care in the world, and they wonder what's up with you. How come you're not doing this with us? How come you're not jumping in? Come on, get some, go for it, man. This is, this is for you, right? All of a sudden, whereas before you got saved, they never offered you anything. After you got saved, they started saying, hey, it's free. It's on me. Come on, we'll buy the drinks. Come on, come on over. We'll do this. Hey, everybody wants to be with you. Where are you at? See, it's not always popular to say, yeah, the word is for me, but I- I- I'm not going to follow the crowd. Let me say these words to you. It's hard to swim upstream. It's difficult. But it doesn't matter what popular opinion says, doesn't matter where my family's going, doesn't matter where my friends are going, doesn't matter where this nation is going, doesn't even matter where the church is going. If they're not following Jesus, I'm not keeping company, I'm going to wholly follow the Lord my God. That's the question we have to ask. Number one is for who? Who is this for? Is this for me or is this for someone else? Second thing is with whom? Third thing that we see in the book of Hebrews chapter 3 is to whom? Questions to ask when approaching the word. For whom, with whom, and finally, third thing for today is to whom. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 18 says, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? Wow, my goodness. Now we see that God swore here that they would not enter his rest. Sometimes people read something like that and say, Oh my goodness, I don't want God to swear anything over me. That would be terrible. But listen, God swore other things in the Bible. God swore good things, promises, blessings. God swore that Abraham would be blessed so that he could be a blessing. Swore that out of his seed would come the promised Messiah. That was a good thing that God swore to Abraham. How how about to King David, that he would never uh, cease to have somebody on his throne following him in his lineage? Well, that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so God swore good things to these great people of faith. How about to Jesus himself? God swore that you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And now here Jesus is standing, our high priest, interceding on our behalf. He has an unchangeable priesthood now. God swore that to Jesus Christ. So yes, we do want God to swear things to us. We want the good things. So the question is to whom? What is the outcome? Where are we going with this? If I wholly follow the Lord my God, what is the road that I'm going to be walking? You see, as we look at the nation of Israel... And we see them going through the wilderness. There was one of two things that they were doing in the wilderness. They were either walking or they were wandering. Think about that for a second. The nation of Israel, as they were going through the wilderness, they were either walking or they were wandering. God's original intent, God's original design and original plan was to get a hold of the nation of Israel. And he wanted to draw them out of Egypt And then he wanted to have them enter in to the promised land, right? And it was supposed to be a short walk 
through the promised land. But when they got to the border, and when they got up to the edge of the promised land, they operated in unbelief, and they were turned back to wander in the desert for 40 years until that generation died off, and then finally God walked them back into the promised land. So in our lives, when we look at this, to whom? We have to ask the question of ourselves. Is the word for me? Who am I going to keep company with, and where am I going? What is the outcome? Am I walking or am I wandering? When it comes to our lives, what position are you in? Has God spoken to you, and are you walking into the promise, or have you missed God, and now you're wandering in the wilderness? The answer to figure out where you're at is faith. If you want to know whether you're walking or whether you're wandering, the question for you and I is, am I in faith? To whom? Where is this going? What is the outcome? Is the outcome faith and obedience? Or is the outcome unbelief and rebellion? That will determine whether or not you're walking or whether or not you're wandering. Hebrews chapter 3, you're there already. Verse number 19 says, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And you know the story. Because they disobeyed God, because they rebelled, because they did not believe the promise of God, they were turned back around and they were wandering in the desert 40 years. But if we're going to be walking through the wilderness, then we've got to be in faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 7, say it with me if you know it. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So if you want to determine whether or not you're walking or whether or not you're wandering, faith is the answer. If you're in faith, you're walking. If you're walking in obedience, hey, you're going to enter into the promise of God. But if you're in unbelief, doubt, fear, rebellion, then you're wandering in the wilderness couple of questions that we saw today to ask when approaching the word. Number one is for who? Who is this for? Is this for someone else? Is this just for the pastors? Or is this for me personally? Second question we asked is with whom? Whose company will you keep? Will you be somebody who's with the company of the righteous or the company of fools? And finally, to whom? Where does this lead? Does it lead to faith or does it lead to unbelief? Am I walking or am I wandering? If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, give him a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hey, I want to talk to you guys before you leave. Just want to take a moment of your time and make sure that you're right with God before you leave this place. It'd be a tragedy if you guys came into the house of God, had such a great time with God, got touched by the Holy Spirit, praised and worshiped the Lord. We laughed and we cried. Well, you guys were great today, by the way. Thank you for letting me preach the word to you. I believe you really got something from God, and thank you for letting me do that. And I know you heard the word of the Lord today, but it'd be a tragedy if we had such a great time and then you walked out of this place, you died, your heart wasn't right with God, and you went to hell. God forbid that should happen to anybody. I, I don't want that to happen to you. And let me tell you this too, God doesn't want that to happen to you. It's not the desire or the plan of God for you to go to hell. God wants you with him. But the problem is, is that a lot of people don't know how to get to heaven. Jesus said these words. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. You can read that in the Bible. Jesus said those words. What does that mean? That means that it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee way. No, we've got to get there God's way. And don't you think that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who penned the plan of redemption, carried it out on the cross in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, the one who was raised again to life, don't you think that if he wanted us to be with him in heaven that he would tell us how to get there? Well, he does in his word. Doesn't leave it up to you or me or some well-meaning church committee. Not all roads lead to God. You got to get there one way, and that's how the Bible says to get there. Sometimes people say, well, that's good news, Pastor, because I've been a good person. I was raised in church, done a lot of good deeds in my life. You know, I was bad for a little while, but I changed my behavior, and now I'm good. Uh, I went to Sunday school or catechism class or Sabbath school class, wore a cross or St. Christopher. You were baptized or christened as a child and born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven denying hell. Right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're a good person, you get to go to heaven. You can't be good enough because the standard is perfection. And the only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. Not going to get to heaven just by being good. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, be good enough, you get to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. I don't see anywhere in the Bible it says go to religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child. And you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And, and contrary to popular belief, America is not the Christian nation in that if you're born in America, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. 
And God doesn't look at your life and see, hey, well, they're not any other religions, therefore they're Christians headed for heaven. It doesn't work like that. God doesn't just lump you into that category because you're not something else. I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to not play games today. I'll tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, well, not only have I gone to church as a child, here I am sitting in church right now, sitting in front of you right now. That's great. I'm glad that you're here. But could you show me that in the Bible where you sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It doesn't work like that. Any more than you can go to the ocean, sit in the water, call yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. You're just a person sitting in the water. Okay? You can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Some of you might be thinking, well, I've been involved in church, though. You know, in my last church, I helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, sang in the church, made decisions in the church, taught in the church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. It's great. I'm glad you did those things. But could, could you show that to me in the Bible? Could you? Because it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions, people think of you as a leader, you teach in the classes, or because you get a membership card, that God's looking for your membership card when you enter the gates of heaven. It simply does not work like that. You're not going to make it. Let's love you enough today to tell you the truth. Some of you might be thinking, but I know God. I mean, I, I celebrate Easter last week, celebrate the resurrection, sing the songs at Christmas every year of my life. I, I could even quote scriptures from the Old and New Testament, tell you stories out of the Bible. That's great. I'm glad you can do those things once again. But can you show me where head knowledge gets you into heaven? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you know God, you get to go to heaven. In fact, if you've read your Bible, you would know that Demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself knows who Jesus is and quotes scriptures in the Bible, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and then you get to go to heaven. But rather, this is about your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Now, I know our society and pop culture has made a mockery out of that term, but this is not about what society or pop culture says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, the third chapter, last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that mean? Well, it means a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, your call, your choice. Will you give God all of your heart and all of your life, or will you not? I'm going to give you an opportunity here in a moment. Jesus said these words. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, here's your opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together just like this. Bang! That's your opportunity. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven and denying hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, well, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be. Might be embarrassed. But get over it. Why? Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Today, come on, will you give him all your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Will you just get your hand up and acknowledge your Jesus, your, your need for Jesus in a moment here? Who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure about your salvation, come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand? Finally, if you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can get right with God in this safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, or even on the live stream, God's watching right where you're at. And then you can respond to God with the blue button right afterwards. Or if you're in the foyer, you can come in or in the Love Rock Cafe, tell an usher right afterwards. We're here for you. Okay? All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, wherever you're watching from, get ready to get your hands up. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go on the count of three all together. One, two.
two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. There's four, five. Thank you. Six. Thank you. Seven, eight. Got you guys. Up on top. Nine, ten. Thank you. Eleven, twelve. Thank you. Got you. God bless you. Twelve wise people already on this side. There's thirteen. Thank you. Fourteen. Thank you. God bless you. Up on top there. Where are you at? Just wave it at me a little bit. Okay. Up on top. Where are you at? I think we got about fourteen or 15, okay, up on top there. Anybody else real quick? Thank you in the family room, 16. Thank you. On this side, anybody in that family room? All right. Thank you, 17. Got you up there. 18, got you right there. Thank you, 19. God bless you. Oh, don't you just feel 20? Where you at, number 20? Come on, get your hand up real quick. Let us know that's you. Thank you, number 20. 21, come on. Come on, where you at? Don't clap, don't clap, don't clap, don't clap. I know it's exciting. We'll clap in a minute. But hey, where you at? Number 21. Where you at, number 21? You know you need to do this. Know you need to get right with God. Anybody else real quick? There's 20 wise people already. You won't be alone. Their point. Thank you, number 21. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. 21 wise people. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, here's what I want you to do. All 21 of you, if you're number 22, number 23, number 24, number 25, hello. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do in a moment. If you raised your hand or if you should have raised your hand, I want you to get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies. But we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you just come right now. Get your stuff, get in the aisle, and meet me up front. Come on, let's welcome them as they come. Lord, I give you my heart. No one leaves during this time. Let them come. I give you my soul. Hallelujah. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Every breath that I take, every moment. Anybody else, if you need to come, you can come too. Lord, Hallelujah. They're still coming from the family rooms. You can bring your kids. Come on down. Come on down. Lord, I give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. Anybody else, if you need to come, come on. Come on. And I live for you. Just slip in the aisle and make your way to the front. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Hallelujah, they're still coming. Come on, let's give them a hand. Lord, come on, you can come too. You can come too. In me. Lord, I give you my if your child raise their hand. Come on, bring them. Bring them, they'll remember it. I'll live. All right, all right. Hey, as people are still coming, if you still need to come, just make your way to the front. There's room for you up here. Hey, everybody up front. My goodness, it looks like a lot more than 21 people came up, all right? That's good news. Good thing. All right. Now, everybody, look up at me for a second. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. You came to give God all of your heart, and you came to give God all all of your life. You're going to do that in a moment. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. This is Pastor Dave right over here in the brown coat. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? What are they going to do to me, right? He's not going to take in the back and beat you up or anything like that. What he's going to do, he's going to do three things. I'll let you know what they are in advance so that you're not concerned. Number one thing he's going to do is pray a simple prayer to invite Jesus Christ into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free stuff. A couple little booklets that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to give you absolutely free what we call a spiritual personal trainer. Let me describe it to you like this. It's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Remember we asked that question, is this for me? Well, you guys just said, yeah, this is for me, and you responded to Jesus. But the second question is with who, right? Well, we want to give you some people who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Your old friends in the world, they'll take you back to the world. And SPT, or a spiritual personal trainer, is a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord and go on with God. It's free. You need to do it, all right? Make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way. Just give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.